Take your Bibles, if you would, and let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to pick back up where we left off this morning. While you're turning there, let me repeat a verse that I, I brought up this morning. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. The defining attribute of a child of God is love. He said, by this, by love, that's how people will know that you're my disciple. And I bring that up because tonight we're going to talk about the power of love. Now, unfortunately for you, I preached this passage of Scripture less than a year ago, right at a year ago. And I was unaware that we were going to be going through 1 Corinthians and eventually we get to this point. So it will be hard in some ways not to repeat myself. But I figure that you've already forgotten most everything I said last Sunday, let alone last year. So I'm not really worried about it. 1 Corinthians 13 is neatly tucked between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. And if you remember that, that's important because... And you look at chapter 12 and chapter 14, he's dealing with spiritual gifts. And it's like Paul takes a time out to point out something in between all of those because they were desiring spiritual gifts and they were even a little bit puffed up because of their spiritual gifts. And he takes a time out to show them something, a more excellent way, something that is superior to all that, and that is love. Love exceeds all of those things, and without it, we're going to find out that everything that we do is futile if there is not love at the basis of our service. Now, I want to tell you something. I love, I love coming to church. I, I love our, our facilities. I love our people. I love singing songs. But all of that, if we're not loving people where they are, then all that we're doing is just a bunch of noise and a bunch of nothing. And that's not what I said. That's, that's, you're going to see that in the Bible in just a second. And so all of you who know your Bibles will know that chapter 13 is the golden chapter on love. And this is a beautiful ode on love written by Paul. And he's writing, he's writing to a church that is divided and needs to find unity. And all churches that are going to be healthy have to be unified. And the, and the unifying aspect of any church is going to be the Christian agape love of the hearts of God's people who learn how to love others more than they love themselves. And the reason why churches tend to struggle so much in unity is because we struggle in the aspect of love so often. We tend to love ourselves very much. And when I love me a whole lot, it makes it hard to love anybody else. But the Bible tells us, that, and it warns us for a man not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And listen, friends, when we, turn, when we learn how to love other people and exalt Jesus Christ, it will bring unity in your heart and in your church and in your life. And we'll get into some of all that. But Paul is trying to share with them a more excellent way at the end of chapter 12 he said, verse 31, he said, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Let's begin in verse 1 here of chapter 13 and read down through verse 8. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. The word charity is, is the word love, so I'm going to substitute it. Uh, I'm going to substitute the word love in for charity, but that's what it is. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffers long, uh, is kind, Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, and is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. 
beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And skip down to verse 13. He says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So I want you to look at this with me because love is going to be so important. Now, I, I want to balance this out. Everything has to have balance. Would you agree with that? You need a well-balanced diet. You need balance in your day-to-day -day life. Everything that you do needs to have balance. And the church is not any different. We, we came out of an age, I feel like, where churches were often truth-heavy. It's just, I'm going I'm to slap you in the face with the cold, hard truth, right? But then we kind of moved over in the church age to a, a, an age of truth relativity and where love seems to dominate. You know, truth doesn't really matter as much to some people now as love does. Just, truth doesn't really matter. Let's just make sure that we love everybody. But the Apostle Paul, who wrote about the importance of love, told us to preach the truth in love, right? So there has to be a balance of truth and love because love, love gives warmth to truth. Nobody likes the cold, hard truth. But if you know that, it, that somebody loves you, they can tell you hard things and you can take it because love is going to give warmth to that truth. And then truth does something for love too. Truth gives depth to love. Because if I love you and I love you outside of the truth, there's really no depth to my love at all. Love is going to bring truth to you. And it's going to bring it in a way that is palatable and usable and acceptable to the hearer. And so we have to be careful about all of that. But we need to excel in our ability to love other people. It is a force that will change the world when nothing else will change the world. So I want to share a few thoughts with you. Number one, let's think about the preeminence, the preeminence of love. Love, he tells us that love excels a few things. Number one, it excels oratory, our speech. In verse 1, he said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The, the world has heard enough loveless lectures and sermons. I can't, I can't lecture somebody into heaven. I can't, nobody has ever been argued into heaven. You ever notice that? You know, if you go out and start witnessing to somebody and they share a different opinion than you, and you begin to argue about biblical doctrines and things of that nature, you could possibly win the argument, but guess what you're going to do? You're going to lose the person, the person you're seeking. Uh, nobody's ever been argued into heaven. Uh, love is what brings that warmth to that truth. Many preach and teach, but they don't speak the truth in love. And there's a lot of emphasis today in, in the charismatic realm on the speaking in tongues and all of these spiritual gifts. But tongue speaking is not really a sign that you are filled with love. That's not a sign that you're filled with love. And a lot of people are looking at these, these tongues as a picture of a spirit-filled person. A, a spiritual person is not really noted by their gifts of the Spirit. Now listen carefully. Because you may be gifted. I mean, a lot of people are gifted people, but they're not spiritual people. Hey, listen, you could be gifted to sing and play and get up here, and you could lift up your hands, and you can praise God, and still not be a spiritual person. You could be doing it for yourself. There, there may not be a love for God in your, in your song or in your voice or in your heart. And he says when love is not there, it's nothing but a bunch of noise. It's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. The, the real evidence of a spiritual person is not spiritual gifts, but spiritual fruit. And here's the thing. You cannot manufacture spiritual fruit. It has to be produced from a heart of love that we get when the Spirit of God indwells us and He begins to naturally produce fruit from the inside out. 
And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and on and on and on you go. And so there's the fruit of the Spirit. You want evidence of a spiritual person? Find somebody who has spiritual fruit, and among that fruit will be love. And that's far better than all the noise we can have. I, mean, I can get up here and I could impress you. Well, I, I can't, but other people can impress you with eloquent speech and theology. And you could go, wow, look how smart and wise and, uh, and eloquent he speaks and how wonderful. But if there's not love in our heart for the lost soul, it's just a bunch of noise. And I'm afraid, listen, I'm afraid a lot of people are just making a bunch of noise. I heard about a, a man that was invited to hear his friend's pastor preach, and after the service, he asked him how he liked the pastor. He said, I don't like him. So that's better not to even ask, by the way. But the next Sunday, he came back, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. And he was asked why he came back if he didn't like the preacher. And he said, I didn't like the preacher's sermon, but when I left last Sunday, he shook my hand and told me that he loved me. And he said, I did like that. I preached at the associational meeting Thursday night. And one of the pastors said, I want to go on record as saying I didn't enjoy that sermon. Well, I didn't preach it for his enjoyment. He said, but I did need it. He did tell me later. He said, he did tell me he loved me. I like that. You may not like the preaching of God's word, but we all want somebody to love us, right? It can make the difference. What preaching cannot do, love can do sometimes. It can soften the heart of people so that they can be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people need to know that we love them. So love excels oratory. Number two, love excels prophecy. In verse two, he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, have all faith, but don't have love, I am nothing. It, it, it excels all of this. Prophecy is the ability to speak theological truth concisely and in a forthright way. It's the ability for someone to take God's truth and put it out there for you so that you can see it and you can hear it and you can understand it. And you go, I understand what you're saying to me. It's somebody who can take God's word, understand how God moved in history, how God is moving it throughout the scriptures, and can take that and give it to the hearers so that it can bless them and help them gain knowledge. But what good is a teacher and a preacher who does not have a loving heart, who doesn't show the people that he loves them? Most people, listen, I have discovered that most people who I have ever led to Jesus Christ are people who I built relationships with first. Most people don't just walk into our church, hear somebody preach, and come down the aisle. It does occasionally happen because the, the, the power of God's word is still there. And if the preacher stands preaching and he has a heart of love and he hears that, and maybe somebody else has already planted some seed, but that's very rare that someone just walks in and hears it. It almost never happens that I meet somebody for the very first time knocking on the door and share the gospel with them that they get saved right there. That happens very rarely. But I'll tell you what does happen. That as you go through your daily life and you build relationships with people in the world where you are, people can begin to know you and to love you, and you can show them Christian kindness and love and respect, that there will come a time when you're able to share the gospel, and they will be far more receptive to the truth, to your understanding of God's word, once they know that you love them. I have found that to be far easier. It does take a little more time. It takes a little investment on the part of the person who's sharing the gospel. But guess what? The person who has a heart of a love will not mind investing in other people, their time and their energy. When you look at the Bible, we, we need to start looking at the Bible a little bit differently. We need to start reading it Instead of reading it like a history book, we need to read it as a love letter from our Heavenly Father. He loves us. One little boy was asking his dad the difference between the seraph and the cherub, the angelic beings. And the father got down his Bible dictionary and began to look it up. And he said, well, cherub means knowledge. And he said, seraph means 
flame or passion. So the article went on to explain that the cherubim were angels that excelled in knowledge, while the seraphim were angels that excelled in love. And the little boy said, well, if I were an angel, I would want to be a seraph because I would rather love God than just know him. Love is going to be more important. It excels prophecy. Number three, love excels faith. He said, though I have faith so that I could remove mountains. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. Faith is wonderful. It's good to have faith. You must exercise faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. The Bible instructs us that the just shall walk by faith and not by sight. And you can have faith that might even move mountains. But it amounts to nothing if you don't have love. What good is faith that can move a mountain but can't move malice out of your heart. What good is that? Our faith in Christ ought to move us to love. He says, now abide in faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. It excels faith. Love is supreme. Number four, love excels charity. Look at verse three. He begins to talk about giving of himself. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profiteth me nothing. We can be charitable. Many people give to charities because they feel guilty. They don't give of themselves, they just give of their money. But listen, you, you can love and you can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. Love is going to cre create a, a charitable heart in the person who has that love in their heart. And it's going to cause us to want to give of ourselves to somebody else. But listen, I, I can give all my stuff away. He said, listen, you can go down here. You can get on the bus and go down to Tulsa and feed the homeless, give them your clothes, take money out of your wallet, and give it to them. If there's not love in your heart for them and for that person and for their spiritual well-being, he said, it is nothing. It's nothingness. I mean, how many people give away things to people but never really give themselves away to those people? I'm all for feeding somebody. You know, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him the rest of his life. I'm all for helping somebody, but love will cause me to do more than just give away my things. It'll cause me to give away myself. And let's just be honest, a lot of people don't want to do that. My time is my time. My effort is my effort. And I, I just don't have time to do all that. I'll just roll down my window and slide a $5 bill out the window far better to give yourself away. He even talks about martyrdom. He said, though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it, is, it profits me nothing. So many go as far to lay down their lives in martyrdom, but still, they don't do it because of love. Brian and I got in trouble recently because a lady told me all religions are based in love. I said, no, they're not. Brian said, no, they're not. And then Brian opened his mouth. He said, what about the Muslim? The radical Muslim. To which she said, this conversation is over. And it wasn't because she called the church and complained about us, but her husband did. Muslims will declare a holy war. And, uh, and many will give their lives to their cause. But it's not a religion of filled with love. Kill the infidel. Guess who the infidel is? It's you. That's not love. Though I give my body to be burned, if I don't have love, it's nothing. It profits me nothing. So we see the preeminence of love. Number two, see the perfection of love. Love will help perfect the believer. And perfection, I don't mean sinless perfection, completion, maturity. It helps mature us and make us better. I hope that you're better than what you were when you got saved. If you're not, then you've been stunted in your spiritual growth and you need to come out of that. But love will perfect us to some degree. Notice some things here in verses 4 through 7 that love is and love does. Number one, it enables you to be patient. How many of you struggle with patience? Let's see your hand. All right. Hurry up. I'm tired of waiting on you. Raise your hand. 
Patience is a difficult thing, isn't it? We all want patience, but none of us want the way that we get patience. Because tribulation worketh patience. Love will give us patience. He said there, love, in verse 4, love suffereth long. That's patience. Love is a patient thing. Love isn't blind. I know sometimes we think love is blind. You go to Walmart late at night, and you see two people holding hands, and you go, yep, love is blind. Love actually isn't blind. Love still sees. And love sees the faults and loves anyway. It's patient. Love suffers long. It endures things. It, it sticks around when nobody else does. Love is what brings somebody in when everybody else is going out. It gives you the patience to deal with other people. Love does not give a person what he deserves. It gives him what he truly needs. When you have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, it will produce a, a patient, loving heart inside the believer. Patience is a difficult thing. Long-suffering or patience is cultiva cultivated by the seeds of love in your heart. So if you're struggling with patience, you know that you need to cultivate love in your life because love enables you to be patient. Number two, it enables you to be kind. Be kind. Let's be, let's be honest. That's another fruit of the Spirit that sometimes is hard to find in people. People who are just genuinely kind to other people. It's a fruit of the Spirit that is known as gentleness or goodness. A person with a loving spirit will be a kind-hearted person. They can't help it. You know, I mentioned this story last time, but there was a woman that joined the church one Sunday and later talked to the pastor. And she said, do you know why I joined your church? It was not because of your preaching. It was not because of the singing or anything like that. But one morning, I overheard a woman criticizing you sharply and unfairly to your face. And I watched you as you reacted to her. And he said, I, she said, I saw that you treated this woman with kindness and how you responded to her. And she said, I knew at that moment I wanted you to be my pastor. And it could be just because she wants a pastor she can scream at without any consequences. I don't know. I would like to think it's because he responded with kindness. And people will test your kindness, won't they? And you've got to figure out who you are. It is Christian kindness, listen, it is Christian kindness that will win lost people to Jesus Christ. People don't need our criticism. Criticism is not a spiritual gift. If it were, I know people who'd have a double portion. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness and gentleness is what will bring people over to the cause of Christ. I've had so many people say, well, I would like to come to church, but look at me. You know, I just don't look like church people. And I always tell them, I say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven and see what all them church people look like. I think we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven to see what people look like up there. They're going to look different than us. And I always tell them, listen, any real Christian with love in their heart will show kindness to you no matter how you look. Because kindness and patience and love don't see those things. It sees past all that and, and it sees somebody who needs Christ. Kindness is what wins people. The church members in Corinth, listen, they, they couldn't even get along with one another. How in the world are we going to get along with the lost world if church members can't even get along with each other. Now, I want to challenge you right here, right now. In church, people get their feelings hurt sometimes. Let's take a little survey since you're all asleep. How many of you in all the years you've been going to church have ever had your feelings hurt in church? Raise your hand. Let's see them. If you've never had your feelings hurt in church, you just stick around. Am I wrong? Now, here's, here's the challenge to you. The next time somebody hurts your feelings, return kindness to them. 
kindness. Show patience and return kindness for their evil. That will be a mark of a true Christian. And I tell you what it'll do, it'll win them over. To you ever heard the expression, kill them with kindness? It's hard to yell at somebody who's being nice to you. You completely diffuse people, and you end up winning them over to your side. And at the end, they like you more than the person they were fighting for in the first place, probably. Give them kindness. Number three, it enables you to be humble. And Lord, is it hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, right? He says in verse four, he says, love vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up. It doesn't boast of itself. I used to play golf quite a bit, and I used to think I was good at it. I'm not any good at it anymore. And shut up, Brian. Uh, I would play with my wife's uncles and cousins, and every now and then I'd hit a good shot. Once every 18 holes, I hit one good shot. And I would talk about that one shot for the next hour. And Kara's uncle looked at me one day. He said, you know, Matt, we would brag on you if you'd give us a chance. <laughs> Love enables me to be humble. It does not envy. It does not vaunt itself. Hey, here's a good test of this. Some people think, well, my greatest Christian attribute is my humility. But here's a good test of your humility, honestly. Can you rejoice at the successes of other people? That's a good test. You see, love and pride do not dwell in the same heart. You can have a big head. And you can have a big heart. But a big head and a big heart are never on the same person. Never. Someone who's got a big, humble heart does not have a big head. They don't. And, and humility is not thinking poorly of yourself. Humility is simply not thinking of yourself. It's rejoicing with other people, seeing what they have, and being happy for them. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. If e it's ego versus ego. And we're talking to a church that had problems. We're talking to a church that's divided, is struggling for unity, and there's ego against ego. They, they thought they were the super saints because they had all of these spiritual gifts and they're, and they're vaunting themselves. And, and Paul's over here saying, listen, if I could have prophecy and tongues and knowledge and all of these things, it's nothing without love. If you can't be humble and you can't rejoice for other people in your church, it's going to be ego versus ego, and there's going to be trouble in your church. There's going to be divisions. There's going to be schisms. But love allows me to step back and rejoice that you are blessed. Every year I go and do a revival at, uh, at Vianne, Oklahoma, for my dear friend Steve Spires, and, and I go to his home. And he has a barn dominium out back behind his house. It's a barn with like a little condo on the inside. And that's where I live for a few days. And it's, he's got a house. It's just a, it's just a simple home. It's a very simple home. It sits up on a giant hill in Sequoia County. And when you go to the front porch, the front porch is covered and big and wide. There's chairs there, and it goes off a big hill like this. And you can see the Arkansas River coming in like this, moving in. And behind him is 90 acres of prime, prime whitetail deer hunting land. Praise God. And there's a wildlife refuge back to the west. And wildlife refuge in the river. And, and I go there. And every year I have to learn how to rejoice for him. Love allows me to be happy that he lives there and not me. And I'll say it's hard. When I'm sitting on his front porch drinking coffee in the breezes, and there's a deer bedded down in the driveway, I'm just, I'm so happy for you, Steve. He don't even notice. He don't even care. It just drives me crazy. 
But love allows me to rejoice for somebody else. Love enables you to be humble. Can I say this, that nothing sets a man more out of the reach of Satan than humility. And nothing will put you closer in proximity to him than your pride. Love will teach us to be humble. Number four, love enables you to be courteous. He says here in verse 5 that it does not behave itself unseemly. That's courtesy. That's What that is is courtesy is love and little things. Courtesy says please and thank you. It, it, it is love that steps back and gives another person first place. Our homes, our workplaces, our churches, would all be nicer places if people could just learn to be courteous and say, no, you first. And listen, courtesy and humility are closely linked. Wouldn't you agree? That if I'm a humble person who doesn't think of himself, I won't have any problem putting you in front of me and saying, you first. And then saying, please, and thank you. It's amazing how how quickly people can lose their religion right after leaving church. They can come here and they can lift their hands and sing and praise God and then they go right out here to the restaurant and they didn't get seated in time. Or somebody else got their food. Well, we ordered before them. Well, I don't know anybody around here starving to death. You got five more minutes, you can wait. Courtesy. And fly off the handle and Love is unselfish. It seeketh not our own. These are all things that, that we struggle with. I don't know if you do, but I struggle with all of them. Not seeking my own. And not easily provoked. Number five, it enables you to be forgiving. He says in verse five, it says, it seeketh no evil. That is a bookkeeping term. Basically what that means is love doesn't keep records. And let's be honest. Most of us struggle with that. We do. It's really easy. It's really easy to think about all the ways that somebody has harmed me or wronged me. And it's really easy for me to keep all that locked away in my heart and go, you know what? I'm not forgetting that. But when we learn how to love people, we can we can get to a place where we don't keep record. And we can forgive, and then we can do our best to forget it and put it away. I'm glad that Jesus loves me differently than most people in my life. He doesn't remember my sin. He doesn't bring it up, and he doesn't keep record of that for me and throw it in my face. Now, Satan, he does that quite regularly. He's the accuser of the brethren. But God forgives. Don't be vengeful. Ask God for a forgiving heart. Don't keep record. Don't get hysterical and historical. Number six, it enables us to be sympathetic. Verse six says it rejoices, it rejoices in the truth. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Godly love does not rejoice in injustice. It rejoices in the true things. It does not listen to gossip and slander. Some people love a juicy piece of gossip and slander on rye. Right? Oh, I love me some gossip and slander. But love will just say, you know what? You don't even need to tell me that. I don't want to hear. Do you know who loves gossip? You're like, who is it, Brother Randy? <laughs> it's you. No. Uh, you know who loves gossip? A person who relishes the failures of other people. And why else would you relish the failures of other people other than the fact that you have a, self, a poor self-image and you don't have a whole lot of Christian love in your heart? Because real love does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. I, I, real love doesn't say, boy, I can't wait to hear the next stupid thing that sister so-and-so did or brother so-and-so did. 
It does not rejoice in those things. It rejoices in success. When brother so-and-so does good or sister so-and-so does this, they can rejoice in that. That's what love does. If we would all just follow the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. Thirdly, let's look at the permanence of love. Verse 13. He says, Now by faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. First of all, it conquers all things. Love conquers all things. There are a lot of things that will not endure. When you're looking at these spiritual gifts and these people in Corinth were really excited about all of this. They were desiring to have these spiritual gifts and they were even abusing them for their own honor and glory. And Paul tells them, listen, these things are, some of these things are going to pass away. But love is going to endure. It's going to be there. It conquers all things. Do you know how to get rid of an enemy? Make him a friend. Make a friend out of your enemy. Isn't that what Jesus said to do? To love your enemies? Make a friend out of them. Love conquers all things. And many people can argue about theology, but a loving heart will conquer the unbelief of many people and win them to Christ. You're going to have to conquer their unbelief with your love, not your theology. Because most people don't really even care. Elizabeth uh, Barrett was an invalid, and, and she couldn't even walk. She could not leave, uh, could not even lift up her head from her pillow. Robert Browning came to visit her one day, and she fell in love with him. On, her fir- on his first visit, she lifted up her head for the first time in months. On his second visit, she sat up in her bed. And on her third visit, she eloped with him. That's the power of love. It can win over people that nothing else can. Love conquers all things. I don't know that we'll ever ever be guilty of loving people too much. But boy, we ought to try. Number two, it completes all things. Compared to love, everything else is just kid stuff. It's time to put away childish things and manifest mature agape love in our lives. And, and do me a favor, would you? Learn how to love outside your circle. Learn how to love people who are different than you. That's a hard thing to do. But when I look at Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, the Bible says that he looked upon the multitude. And he was moved with compassion because they were as sheep being scattered abroad and having no shepherd. In that multitude of people that Jesus loved were all kinds of people. People of different backgrounds, socially, economically, ethically. People of all ages and ranges, people of all different kind of status And yet Jesus loved them all. And listen, friends, sometimes we're guilty of only loving in our circle. And we never extend that love to people outside of our own little world. But I challenge you that the next time that you're out somewhere and you see somebody, instead of judging them in your mind because of what you see, instead of judging them, love them with your heart. then let the Holy Spirit press you with the impulse, maybe to even go speak to them and share the gospel or invite them to church. Love conquers all things and it completes all things. A little boy was taken to Sunday school for the very first time by his mother. They were very poor. He was barefoot and had uh, worn out hand-me-down clothes and he was taken into the beginner's class, and all the boys and girls that were in there were dressed so nicely. And uh, he was the only one that was barefoot. And the teacher set him up on her lap, and she said to him, she said, Jackie, do you know that Jesus loves you? And he asked, he said, does he love me 
as much as he loves all these other kids that have nice clothes? She hugged him and she said, he probably loves you more than anyone in this room today. And the little boy said he never forgot that. And he grew up to pastor the largest Baptist church in America because someone loved him. A poor little barefooted, homely looking kid grew up to win hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to Christ and pastor the largest Baptist church in America because somebody showed him love. When we used to go feed the homeless before that program changed gears on us, we'd get off the bus over there in Tulsa, and anybody who went with us will remember this. Who was the first person that always greeted us? Dwayne. I don't know if you remember Dwayne, but Dwayne was, he'd been homeless for 47 years when we met him. He had no teeth. He didn't bathe. And he was rough, his dirty clothes. Couldn't hardly understand what he was saying. You had to get real close, and that was tough sometimes. But you know what? I always wanted Dwayne to know that we loved him. You know, and one thing I loved about those trips was the number of people who would get off that bus and go hug Dwayne. That's what love does. It goes and gets out of its circle and it hugs people and says, I don't really care what you look like, what you smell like, where you came from. I love you because Jesus loves you and Jesus loves me just wraps its arms around people who we normally would not wrap our arms around. Love completes all things. Number three, it continues over all things. He tells us here that after everything else passes away, love will continue. When we enter the next life, faith and hope will be no more. We won't need them. Our faith will have become sight. Our blessed hope of the soon return of Jesus will have been fulfilled. We won't need faith and hope anymore, but love will still be there. Faith saves us. Hope cheers us. But love is for other people. It's not for us. It's for others. We ought to give it out. And we ought to share the love of Christ with other people. I want to end with this thought as our musicians put start to come up and we prepare to close. Jacob, in Genesis chapter 29, I love that story. That is one of the most passionate, hot love stories in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. The Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel. And he labored, if you remember the story, he labored for her for seven years and and, and he was tricked by Laban, his father-in-law, into marrying Leah because she was the eldest. And he says, listen, I, I wanted to marry Rachel. I love her. He said, well, you serve me another seven years, you can have her too. And the Bible says that he served for her. And, and it says that those seven years seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. Love continues over all things. Love will push us to serve and to give of ourselves. Love will cause us to go the second mile and do whatever it takes. Now abide in faith, hope, and love. But the thing that holds them all together, friends, is love. Now I want to ask you today as we close, are you a loving Christian? And if you're not, here's what you need to do. Say, God, instill in my heart the love that I need. Get on your knees and say, God, help me to love other people. Because love is action. Love is a verb. And I want to share this with you, too. Love is the very essence of the gospel, isn't it? Lost friend, if you've never been saved today, let me say this to you. For God so loved that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. His love gave his son so that you could be saved. And if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, would you come tonight?